we are delighted to welcome you to Glad Tidings Hour. If this is your first time with us, you are especially welcome. If you are a weekly participant, we want you to know that we appreciate your support. And those of you who regularly like, comment, and share our programs are an integral part of the ministry. We have another good hour of hymn singing, an exciting missionary story by my wife Yvonne, and a message from God's Word. It's our prayer that God will bless and challenge you as you watch and listen. So let's get started right away with a medley of old hymns, but wonderful hymns, on the precious blood of Jesus. And the singers are the Child Evangelism Fellowship Choir. So here we go. Let's get started. Many of you are aware of the work of CEF, as it's known, and touching boys and girls' lives right round the world. We praise the Lord for the ministry of CEF, and keep this great work in your prayers as they reach out in the coming summer months to the boys and girls and young people of the nations of the earth. Praise the Lord for the message that they were singing about the blood of Jesus. And this, of course, is part of our ministry, uh, sharing with people about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Now, it, of course, involves seeking and looking for and following up on men and women and young people wherever they are 
So this great hymn uh, brings that thought to us just now. It's Michael Eldridge who is going to sing There Were Ninety and Nine, and this will lead us into Yvonne's story today. There are ninety and nine that safely lay in the shelter of the fold. But one was out on the hills away, far off from the gates of gold. Away on the mountains wild and bare, away from the tender shepherd's care, away from the tender shepherd's care. Lord, Thou hast here Thy ninety and nine, are they not enough for Thee? But the shepherd made answer, this of mine has wandered away from me. And although the path be rough and steep, I go to the desert to find my sheep. I go to the desert to find my sheep. But none of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters crossed Nor how dark was the night that the Lord passed through Where he found his sheep that was lost For out in the desert he heard its cry Was sick and helpless and ready to die Was sick and helpless and ready to die Lord, when to those blood drops all the way that marks out the mountain's track. There is shed for one who had gone astray, and the shepherd could bring him back. Lord, where's to thy hands so rent and torn? They appears tonight by many a thorn. They appears tonight by many a thorn. But all through the mountains thundering and up from the rocky steep There rose the glad cry to the gate of heaven Rejoice, I have found my sheep And the angels echo round the throne Rejoice, for the Lord brings back his own Rejoice, for the Lord brings back his own Mr. Victor Maxwell's book, Angel of the Amazon, is a thrilling story of Dr. Bill Woods. It is a personal insight into the life of this unique man of God. I remember, as a teenager, attending Bill's farewell service, and we had this prayer card in our house for many years. Born in Belfast in October 1937, Bill was the youngest of five children. From an early age, he was brought into contact with the message of God's redeeming grace. It was in Ravenhill Road, Free Presbyterian Church, under the preaching of the young Reverend Ian Paisley, that he came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ on the 20th of July, 1952. Although he was just a young teenager, Bill served the Lord in the Young People's Fellowship and became involved in many of the activities of the church. He was challenged by many visiting missionaries who came to speak. Names that you are now familiar with on our programme are Miss Molly Harvey, the co-founder of the Acre Gospel Mission with Mr and Mrs William McComb, the Munn family, especially Emma, and Janet. They also had a big impact on Bill's life. Their stories of God's miraculous provision when they served God in Africa inspired him. As Mrs Eads, who was formerly Miss Jessie Munn, gave a report at the church one night, God worked in Bill's heart and he gave his life to God for full-time missionary service. In January 1957, when he was 20 years of age, 
he enrolled in the missionary training college of the worldwide evangelization crusade in Glasgow. They were difficult years as he was often ill, but he learned to trust God for his needs, which was invaluable in his future ministry. Bill had already been challenged about Brazil and the work of the Acre Gospel Mission far up the Amazon River. Upon completion of his training, he applied to the Acre Gospel Mission. The committee members of the mission accepted his application but informed him that he would have to do a further year of evangelistic work in Northern Ireland. During that year, many souls were saved in the gospel missions which he and some others conducted, and the Lord reconfirmed his call to the Acre. So on the 20th of August, 1959, a large group of friends gathered at Belfast Harbour to see him off. As the boat left for Liverpool en route for Brazil, they sang... Take the name of Jesus with you. In 1960, Bill eventually arrived at Manaus, 1,000 miles up the river Amazon, where he was greeted by a group of missionary friends and Brazilians who came to welcome him. He went on to Labria for language study, and within a short period of time, he was fully involved in the regular services of the church, trying out his newly acquired Portuguese. He befriended Geraldo, the gardener at the mission property. This was to have a deep significance in his future service, for Geraldo had leprosy. Bill relocated in Canutama a town with just one street beside the river. John and Joan Maudsley were doing pioneer work there. That was where he first experienced prolonged river evangelism, living, eating and sleeping in the boat for as long as six weeks at a time. The team navigated the river tributaries to take the message of the gospel deep into the interior of the forest. Though exhausted by their travels, it was a joy to take the gospel to those who had never heard. The spiritual darkness of the people and their physical suffering greatly touched Bill's heart. One day, he was called to help an 18-year-old boy who had been bitten by a deadly poisonous snake. Yelling in agony, the young man cried out for help. Bill explained there was little he could do medically, but he would pray. As he started to pray, the young man called out, I don't want you to pray, I want you to do something. Bill was unable to offer further help, and the young man died a few days later. The event brought Bill to his knees, where he surrendered his life again to God, saying he would do whatever the Lord had planned for him. When he returned home for his first furlough in 1964, he read the book Ten Fingers for God. It told the amazing story of doctors Paul and Margaret Brand, whose pioneer work of reconstructive surgery on leprosy patients had brought relief to thousands on the Indian subcontinent. The book was a challenge to Bill as he thought about the young man back in Kanutama. Bill started to re-evaluate what God wanted him to do with his life. Before returning to Brazil, he enrolled in a seminar in London under Dr. R.G. Cochran, a renowned leprologist who had revolutionised the treatment of leprosy. He also enrolled in a three-month course at the Missionary School of Medicine near Holborn in London. Unknown to Bill, these experiences were the forerunners of years of medical training which lay ahead for him. Upon returning to Brazil in 1965, he did not have to go looking for leprosy patients. Almost every home in the small town of Canutama had at least one leprosy sufferer. 
he immediately set about trying to give whatever relief he could. It was easy to access patients in the town, but those who lived up the rivers also needed help. This necessitated hazardous river and forest expeditions in order to reach those suffering in isolation. Now, Mildred will sing a very appropriate hymn here. Anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go. Even to the jungles of the Amazon. pointing Bill in the direction of further medical studies. When the University of Amazonas opened a medical faculty in Manaus, he knew that God wanted him to apply for a course in medicine. He would have to take his entrance exams at the university along with other young Portuguese-speaking students. This was a challenge to the Belfast boy, who had never passed a chemistry exam at school and averaged 7% in Latin. He was accepted, and at the end of 1967, he informed James Gunning, the field leader at that time, of his plans. A year later, he moved to Manaus to commence a seven-year medical course in Portuguese. 
Along with some friends, he worked long hours and often studied at night from 10 p.m. at night to 4 a.m. in the morning. He also had clinics and hospitals to attend during this period and supervised a workshop which specialised in making shoes for leprosy patients. Bill was busily engaged in preaching and helping out in the work of God. The long years of study and hardship were rewarded when in 1974 he came top of the graduation class and graduated as Dr. William Woods, M.D. To gain such a degree in a second language was no mean feat. Further specialised training followed in Rio de Janeiro for a further two years where new skills were acquired in eye surgery. About this time, Dr. Bill Woods was invited by the Health Secretary to coordinate the leprosy programme for the entire state of Acre. His reputation had preceded him, and he was judged to be the best man for the job. Little did he know how out of control the disease was in the state, and how ill-equipped the small government team was to deal with it. He gathered around him a first-class team of committed, caring people. Progress was slow at first, but new drugs, a programme of reconstructive surgery, physiotherapy, improved facilities and a new awareness of the disease, all under Dr Wood's leadership, started to make an impact. By 1996, the incidence of leprosy in the Acre state had fallen from 11 patients in every 1,000 to 1.5. Bill was devoted, single-minded, self-sacrificing, persevering, humble, zealous, humorous, an encourager and a good sleeper. All of these helped to shape and make this remarkable servant of God. He received awards from the Brazilian government. In the portrait gallery of the Acre Academy of Medicine, you will find Dr. Bill Wood's portrait among the notable surgeons and scientists. He was also awarded the OBE, the Order of the British Empire, by our Queen in Buckingham Palace in 1997. But these awards were not his motivation. Dr. Bill Woods was moved by the love of God to give his life as a young man for service for his Lord and Saviour. Thousands of lives have been touched both spiritually and physically through more than 50 years of ministry by this humble servant of God. His last river trip was in 2009 when... At 72 years of age, he made a three-hour journey crossing a swollen river on many swollen rivers, in fact, on single logs, avoiding poisonous snakes and eating boiled monkey. Why? To reach one more family with the gospel of God's saving grace. One more away from the tender shepherd's care. He once said, God does not call us to do the job we are fitted to do. He fits us for the job we are called to do. Now, Keith Lindsay, who's the UK representative for Acre, will bring us up to date with Dr. Bill. And he and his wife, Karen, will sing a missionary song to end our story. No less than me. Thank you, Yvonne, for sharing the story of Bill Woods with us. What an amazing story of God's faithfulness. What an amazing story of God's grace and God's provision over so many years. And there are so many accounts that I could tell you today of Bill's life and stories that he's given to us and told us about of his escapades there and his expeditions through the Amazon. This year, Bill will celebrate 62 years of faithful service to God there in Brazil. He loves the people of Brazil. He loves the land of Brazil. He just longs to get back to Brazil, even though he's coming up on 84 years of age. 
At present, Bill is living in Bangor in County Down in his apartment there. He's been there for nearly three years now, uh, having treatment for cancer. He did have some treatment in Brazil, but when he came home here, he has had more treatment, of course, over the last two and a half years. A couple of months ago, his cancer cell count had gone up. And just there recently, he told us that it was coming back down again, which we're so thankful to God for, for answered prayer for him. Bill has had cancer for over 10 years since first he was diagnosed. It's been controlled with treatment over those years, but again, got worse about two and a half years ago. He's a number of side effects also because of the treatment that he's still on, the chemotherapy that he's getting. That one of them uh, being his mobility. One of the things that I would ask you to pray for for Bill today is this. Bill lives in a little apartment in Bangor, but it's on the first floor. He has many steps to climb to get up to his apartment and he's finding that very difficult. Will you pray with us that in some way that God will open up the door of opportunity for him to get uh, into a sheltered dwelling where he also will have the uh, support and security there uh, as well of others who live beside him. Bill longs to go back to Brazil and has talked there just recently about going back to Brazil at the end of the year if the restrictions are lifted. His heart is there. His love for the people is there. His love again for the work of God is there. And we're so thankful for all that God has been able to accomplish through Dr. Bill Woods. Even recently, uh, where through medicine uh, for the lobus disease, they have found a cure for that. And Bill had done all the writing up of that, all the thesis of that. And uh, he got that to the government and now they have given the funding uh, for medicine for this particular disease there in the Amazon. Please continue to pray for him. He very much values your prayers and the support of God's people these days. Thank you for standing with him in the work there in Brazil. As I thought of Bill, I thought of the words of Jim Elliot. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Bill has had rewards, and you've heard about that already today. Bill has had rewards, many rewards, down the years from the government in Brazil, from the Queen here, getting his OBE a number of years ago. But Bill always says, my greatest reward will be when I stand before the Lord someday. And he says, well done, Bill Woods. The song that Karen and I are going to sing together just now is called No Less Than Me. As I thought of this song and singing it today, You know, someone once said, God doesn't want my money, my family, my possessions. God wants me. For when God has me, God has everything that belongs to me. Trust that God will bless this song to your hearts today, no less than me. Of all the gifts that I could bring To gain acceptance by the King There's no treasure great enough To make me worthy of His love It's when I look around and see It's not these things He asks of me He wants my best heart and soul, then my offering will be whole. No less than me I bring to Him, no less than me my offering, nothing else that I could bring as a servant to the King. All I ask Under his control, his child I know I'll always be. That's why I bring no less than me. All kinds of deeds that I might do. Trials that I may go through Cannot bring the victory The 
Father longs to give to me. It's when I give to him my all, and I am yielded to his call. It's then my heart begins to see, my Father wants no less than me. No less than me I bring to him, no less than me my offering. Nothing else that I could bring as a servant to the King. All I am is his, I know, my life is under his control. This child I know I'll always be, that's why I bring no less than you. All I am is his, I know, my life is under his control. This child I know I'll always be, that's why I bring no less than me. That's why I bring no less than me. I'm sure you appreciate the account of Dr. Bill Woods' life given there just now by my wife Yvonne. And thank you also, Keith and Karen, for your message regarding Bill's life and circumstances at present. We appreciate this so very much and all the ministry of these programs that go out week by week. And we trust that wherever you are and wherever you listen to the story about Dr. Bill Woods, that you will remember to pray for this wonderful uh, servant of the Lord and that God will continue to answer prayer for him and for the ministry of Acre Gospel Mission in the far upper regions of the Amazon, as well as in other parts just now in the world. We thank God for this ministry. And now let's just have a moment of prayer together. Lord, we thank you for what we have listened to already today. We thank you for the ministry and the impact of one dedicated life. And we know that there are many others who have been part of this great ministry and are currently serving within the ranks of Acre Gospel Mission. And we pray today that you will bless the ministry of this mission and all those faithful missions and mission agencies that are reaching out into our world to bring men and women and young people to a knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Continue to help us and bless the closing part of this program, we pray. In Jesus, our Saviour's name. Amen. Now, I want to read to you today from the Old Testament Scriptures, and I'm reading from the book of Psalms, reading from Psalm 126, verse 1. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Amen. And may God bless the reading of his word to our hearts. My message today is set against the backdrop of what we have heard already, and my title for my message is Seed Time and Harvest in the Kingdom and principally from those final two verses of Psalm 126, where we read these words, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, 
shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. These are familiar words to many of us who are acquainted with missionary ministry and missionary meetings. And it's words like these that challenge and inspire us in the service of Jesus Christ. The challenge comes in the travail of the sowing, they that sow in tears. But the inspiration comes in the promise and joy of reaping. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. In the preceding minutes of this program, we have been challenged and inspired by the missionary account relevant to the life of Dr. Bill Woods and in lesser measure to some of the other names that were mentioned, but of course also doing an outstanding work for God in the Amazon region. And other missionary accounts in recent weeks have equally challenged us and inspired us. But after listening to the exploits of others, there must be the personal commitment that calls us personally to examine our lives in the light of the Word of God. In the context of the wonderful workings of God's Spirit in Brazil, and particularly in the state of Acre, my thoughts turn to this psalm. Psalm 126. But the principles laid down here are applicable wherever the work of God is being carried on. So what can we learn? What lessons can we draw down from these great verses? They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. First of all, there is the travail of the sowing. The travail of the sowing. They that sow in tears. He that goeth forth and weepeth. The people that we're reading about here in Psalm 126 were people who were returning from captivity. Returning to a land that had been lying dormant and unworked for 70 years. And I can visualize the landscape in its desolation. There was no ready-made seedbed. There was land that was going to test the farmer's endurance and strength to their limit. The tools that they had were not great mechanized monsters of power, but the primitive mattocks and hoes and spades and wooden plows pulled by teams of oxen. It would be a work of Blood and toil and sweat and tears. The scene has many parallels in the work of the Lord. Jesus describes the challenges of sowing in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. Because when he tells us about the farmer who went forth to sow, it says some seed fell on the roadway and on ground that was just like the roadway. Some fell among stones. Some seed fell among thorny bushes and weeds. And other times an enemy came and sowed tares or wild corn among the good seed. What was he describing? Well, he was describing the challenges that faced uh, people in the winning of souls for Jesus Christ. No one experienced the travail of sowing more acutely than the Savior himself. In the book of Hebrews, in the New Testament, we read these words. In the days of his flesh, he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears. In the Gospels, we read, the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against Jesus, how they might destroy him. Again, the master himself said, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And then it says, And he did not many mighty works there, that is in Nazareth, because of their unbelief. We read those words in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 57 and 58. On another occasion, we read about him in the Garden of Gethsemane wrestling in prayer 
amongst the olive trees, and the blood-infused perspiration that fell to the ground like great drops of blood. Indeed, during his earthly ministry, many a night when others went to their homes, he went to the mountainside to pray and seek the Father's will and blessing and guidance and to commit himself to the future ministry the next day and in the succeeding days. And then, of course, the ultimate suffering and the ultimate travail in the final hours of his passion as he became the corn of wheat sown into death at Calvary. Oh yes, the travail of the cross, the travail of sowing. Horatius Bonner uh, has written a, a very, very challenging hymn. And the first words in that lovely hymn are, Go, labour on, spend and be spent. Your joy to do the Father's will. It is the way the Master went. Should not the servant tread it still. Who can record in words the travail of the servants of God as they have traversed earth's continents with the message of the gospel and indeed many of them over the centuries laying down their lives in martyrdom for Jesus Christ but living as if they were already martyred in the service of the King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh yes, the ministry of the kingdom is a ministry often of travail, the travail of the sowing. But then there is the trusting in the seed. Secondly, the trusting in the seed. Bearing precious seed. God never sends his servants into the field of labor without precious seed. One of my boyhood memories on the farm was the arrival each spring of the seed corn that was going to be sown that year. I remember that it came in a special sack with bold black lettering. And on the outside of the sack, these were the words, Certified Seed or Certified Oats. It was stored in a special mouse-proof place until the day when it would be sown in a prepared field. It was precious seed. It had a proven germination quality and it would be of a particular variety, a variety that my father had hoped would produce a bumper harvest. God has given his servants certified seed in the message of the gospel of salvation. The Lord Jesus himself said, the seed is the word of God. In Luke's gospel chapter 8 and verse 11, he tells us the seed is the word of God. The apostle Peter describes it as the incorruptible seed of the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. That's why the apostles went everywhere preaching the message of the gospel in the knowledge that they were sowing seed that was going to transform lives wherever they went. And this is the message that was taken 2,000 miles up the mighty Amazon to Acre State by Bill Woods and others. The gospel of the power of the cross was sown in Brazilian hearts. People heard that Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. They heard about God's remedy for their sin, that he was the light of the world and their darkness could be dispelled. But more than that, they saw the Savior's love through the dedicated lives of the missionaries. I'm reminded of the familiar hymn, Sowing in the Morning, Sowing Seeds of Kindness, sowing in the noontide and the dewy eaves, waiting for the harvest and the time of reaping. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Maybe I should ask a question at this stage. How many seeds and how many sowings have there been in your heart? You have heard the message of the amazing grace of God so many times. But you are still not saved. My prayer is that you will experience the life and power of Jesus Christ in these days. 
There are people in the mission fields of earth who, when they hear the message for the first time, swing wide the door of their hearts and invite the Savior in and experience the joy and a triumph of His grace in their hearts. You can too. And praise God today is a great opportune moment for you to seek the Lord Jesus Christ, to let the seed of His Word land in good ground in your heart, and then to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your own and personal Savior. The third thought that I want to leave with you is that there is the triumph of the harvest. Oh yes, there is the travail of the sowing. There is the trust that the sower has in the seed. We're sowing good seed in the message of the gospel of salvation through the finished work of the cross. And praise God, there is the assurance of the triumph of the harvest. What does the writer say? He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Praise God. Jesus also said in Matthew 13, there was seed that fell on good ground. The most joyful of Israel's yearly celebrations was the Feast of Tabernacles. We read in Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 39, When you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. It was like Thanksgiving Day in the United States of America, extended for a whole week. The certainty of the harvest is written into these words, shall doubtless come again. Many ventures are carried out without any guarantee of success. Crops have been sown with the utmost care, but there are many variables of weather and natural disaster that often scupper the entire project. But here is one venture that is destined to eternal success. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, or shall not be able to hold it back. This was the joy that was set before our Savior, even as he suffered in agony and shame on Calvary's cross. Through suffering, he is bringing many sons to glory, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What joy? The joy of reaching the hearts and lives of people in the continents of earth. And yes, as we've been thinking today, particularly in the great land of Brazil. God didn't call his servants, Mr. and Mrs. Macomb, to the state of Acre in Brazil to invest their lives in a venture that would be a failure. Throughout the succeeding years, the promise of God's word is still being fulfilled in the towns and along the river banks as the harvest of precious Brazilian lives has been gathered into the kingdom of God by the missionaries in Acre Gospel Mission. The same can be said wherever the banner of the cross is lifted high. The celebration of the harvest, it says, doubtless come again with rejoicing. Jesus said, There is joy among the angels in glory over one sinner that repenteth. Oh, the joy of winning precious souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. Heaven celebrates. The missionaries and evangelists and pastors celebrate. And newly redeemed sinners rejoice. Darkness and fear and bondage and superstition and idolatry and guilt are dispelled. Light and peace and freedom and forgiveness and joy and faith in Jesus Christ become living realities. I wonder, can you begin to imagine the celebrations there will be in the glory land when the great multitude, redeemed from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, assemble around the glorious throne above? What rejoicing! 
when those who gave their lives in service for the Savior look around the blood-washed throng and see the trophies of their labors joining to glorify the Lamb unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Unto him be the glory and dominion for ever and ever. And well might they say in the scriptures, Amen. My question is, will you be there? Have you repented and sought salvation by trusting in the finished work of the cross? There can be no better time than now. And you should come to the Savior just as you are. For all who are serving the Lord, let us never forget the promise. Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Oh, may the Lord write his word on all our hearts today and keep us in the service of the Master until the harvest is gathered home. Now we're going to listen to that great song which I referred to a little while ago, Sowing in the Morning, Sowing in the Evening, and then the chorus, Bringing in the Sheaves. Nick and Elaine are the two singers for this lovely song. May the Lord bless it to your heart. Rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing. Now, thank you so much for staying with us today. And may God bless each one of you. And we say bye-bye until our next program when it comes back on the internet and on Facebook and on YouTube in a week's time. God bless you all. Eric Stewart saying bye-bye.